we go ahead and get started and would like to welcome the people who are here and hopefully the people who will continue coming for a while to the inaugural uh, Dale Center uh, Study of War and Society alumni chat. And uh, uh, I would guess that some people in the audience know who I am, but if you don't, uh, I'm the founding director of the Dale Center, uh, Andrew Weist, and our guest tonight, the other person you're going to be see, seeing a lot on the virtual stage here is Dr. Rob Thompson. Uh, the format for tonight's event will take a general form of a conversation between myself and Dr. Thompson uh, about his research and findings, the stuff you're going to be hearing about shortly. Uh, that part of tonight's presentation will last in the neighborhood of 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions uh, from the folks in the Zoom room. And uh, to get those questions to us, all you have to do is get into the chat function here, and we will uh, sift through the chat function and spend the last uh, 20 or 15 minutes of the night uh, forwarding your questions to Rob and have him uh, answer those questions. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanna thank all the supporters of the Dale Center, especially Dr. Beverly Dale, for their continued generosity, which makes events like that of tonight possible. Would also like to thank uh, my wonderful colleagues at the Dale Center. It would take most of the rest of the night to list them, but I think you can see a lot of them here on their little screens. Um, it's, the one, it's those colleagues, their scholarship and mentorship that makes events like tonight. Again, possible because as an alumni chat, this will be the first of having our own students come back and share with us uh, the research that they've done and research that in almost every case will have started uh, with a mentor relationship uh, with one of the members of the Dale Center. And uh, finally, I would like to thank Haley Hasick, our Dale Center graduate fellow, because she's the one that put all the work into getting tonight's uh, presentation organized. Uh, very quickly, I'll introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Robert Thompson III, graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi in December 2016. Wow, it's been that long ago now. With a PhD in US history, he is now a historian at the Army University Press, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. At Army University Press, he helps to produce documentaries to educate viewers on the US, on US Army doctrine and history. And we just got through chatting about um, how he's uh, completing a, a documentary on uh, the fighting in Manila in World War II and is about to move on to the guerrilla fighting in um, the Philippines in World War II and then, then hopes to move on to do another documentary uh, more closely uh, aligned with the Vietnam War. Uh, Rob currently resides with his wife and four children in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Rob is a real Dale Center success story and we're so proud to have him back for this inaugural chat. And this chat is about his first book, which is titled Clear, Hold and Destroy, Pacification in Fu Yen and the American War in Vietnam, a book being released next month by University of Oklahoma Press. So you can hop on Amazon right now and pre-order your copy today. I guarantee it's a book that you'll be happy to have read. This book, which Rob reminded me, um, uh, began with us sitting around in my office wondering what the heck he was gonna write about in 2011, uh, began as his dissertation right here at Southern Miss directed by myself and Dr. Heather Sturr, and it takes a look at the supremely under-researched aspect of the Vietnam War known as pacification. The pacification war in Vietnam, which uh, perhaps uh, goes better under the intellectual statement of the war for the hearts and minds of the people. So my first question to Rob as we begin uh, this give and take in this conversation, uh, Rob, how did you become interested in this particular topic? That's a great question, Andy. Um, first, thanks for having me back. Uh, it's great to be involved uh, in this. Uh, as a graduate, I didn't think I'd ever get this opportunity. So again, it's really cool. Um, looking forward to this, uh, especially since uh, you know this brings the whole topic of Fu for me full circle. Um, and why pacification? Uh, why Fu Yen? Why Vietnam? And that all has to do with that conversation in your office. Um, it also has to do with uh, the papers at the McCain Library and Archives. Um, there's veterans papers there that talk about Fu Yen, talk about the pacification effort there. 
and basically why it wasn't working, or at least indicated that it wasn't working, but the question as to why went unanswered. And that was something you and I had discussed, trying to figure out where was the answer? How could you figure, what, where could you find that answer? And I thought that would be an interesting quest, so to speak. Uh, the papers themselves weren't gonna answer that. Inter interviews alone weren't gonna answer that, but at the very least there was a starting point. And it got me really interested in pacification um, to the point where that's all I could kind of like think about. It got me really interested at the province level of the war in Vietnam. And I would probably, yeah, until I graduated, all I could think about was pacification, Phu Yen, Vietnam War. Uh, it consumed me in a good way. Um, I, so it was definitely a conversation that produced some really fruitful things. I mean, the book's a you know, clear result of that. Well, I mean, something you brought up there is an interesting um, uh, shining of a light on the research project itself. Sometimes you know, research projects are um, born from an idea and sometimes they're born from finding the right source. And you found a very interesting source and we're, we were lucky enough to have it right here in the McCain archives on, on campus. Can you tell them a little bit about the uh, Frobenius papers that, that you kind of dove into first that, that, that uh, led you to the, uh, um, this topic and you actually still have a relationship with the writer of those papers, correct? Uh, correct. Um, uh, haven't, oddly enough, I believe Courtney actually lives out here in Kansas City now. I haven't seen him uh, because of COVID. Um, I haven't talked to him in a while either. Um, however, his papers were extremely informative, especially early on and early conversations with him uh, were really uh, important as well. I'll start with the papers. Um, so a young Courtney arrives in Fu Yen in 1971. And if I recall correctly, his job is to go around and evaluate uh, the territorial forces to see, you know, what their status of training is. Are they ready to take on the security duties? If not, what level of training do they need? So a lot of his uh, duties require him to travel around Fu Yen. And in doing so, he gets a keen sense of the province as a whole. Where are the issues? You know, uh, what hamlets are really in disarray and his papers reflect that he takes really good. He took he took really good notes. Um, a lot of his findings uh, corroborate what I found later, but at the very least, I got a pretty good insight into, at least from the American perspective of a province that seemed to be falling apart pretty late in the war. Um, and that was interesting. So I had, I had a snapshot of 1971, but I didn't know how it got there. I didn't know how the war had fallen apart. I also didn't know what had necessarily had happened after. I mean, I know, nine, I know South Vietnam doesn't exist after April 1975, but I don't know what happens between, but I had, 1970, I had a pretty good idea of 1971. Uh, in conversation, early conversations with Courtney, uh, I got names of other individuals to talk with, uh, se a senior province advisor and his deputy. In conversations with those individuals, I got the opposite opinion of Fu Yen, that it wasn't that bad, that yeah, there were issues, but it could have been a lot worse. And so then I was kind of torn, I'm like, did Courtney not accurately portray the province or did he only see some bad areas and not report on the good parts? And so I was left with maybe it, just, it was a matter of perspective. Um, and so then I was more convinced that I had to start from the very beginning. And so for me in the very beginning ultimately became going back to the French. Uh, at least for the dissertation. And then in, in the book, I went back a little bit further and I looked at the actual uh, Viet people when they invaded southward, just to give a kind of a, a, a 
a broader sense to that Fujian had been a province that was always being pacified by outside invaders to kind of show why that uh, later on the province kind of was just like apathetic to people coming in, trying to do their own thing. Um, kind of getting a little off topic here, but uh, at the very least conversations with Courtney and his papers gave me that like this interesting insight that there was something really interesting going on here um, and I really, really wanted to know why. And Courtney too, at the time, wanted to know why. I think he may even mention in his papers that he was interested at the time, back in 1971 and later, like why had he walked into such a bad province and that like, that bothered him. Like, how did this place get so bad? Because it didn't, there wasn't any like, you know, from what you could tell, any major battles that had made it that bad. There weren't any huge no news stories coming out of the province that said, this is why it's bad. It just was bad. I mean, to me, so. that's fascinating to, to uh, uh, again, I was along with you on this journey to a certain degree, but it's fascinating to see where a, a research topic that's this in depth uh, comes from and how it germinates from you know a, a really interesting source to having to find other sources to corroborate it and you know the depth and have to go back in time and you know to, to make it a full topic now you you've brought up some terms there that i think we need to uh, uh wrestle with a little bit uh, to make the conversation um uh, more uh, uh, transparent uh to people who aren't uh, experts <laughs> on it uh, well, well first off uh, tell me a little bit about fu yan i mean what is that place and why should we care what happened there in the Vietnam War? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of people ask me that, especially at like conferences. It's like, why? Why Fu Yen? Why does it matter? And that took me a while to figure out why it mattered, um, particularly because uh, the Republic of Vietnam or South Vietnam had 44 provinces. That's quite a few. Phu Yen wasn't the most populous. It wasn't the ne necessarily the most strategic, um, but it did matter. Uh, it was the second most important rice producing province in the region. Now the region it was in was the central coastal central highlands. So right in the middle of the Republic of Vietnam on the coast, south of Binh Dinh, they shared a border Binh Din being the most populous, strategically most important, uh, produced the most rice, had the, you know, it, it always came second to Binh Din. Uh, the communists recognized that, played that to, to their advantage. Uh, there's a, a book by Kevin Boylan, uh, Losing Binh Din, that's quite good. Um, and I think if you read our books, maybe together or back to back, you'll, you'll see the similarities, you'll see the, the communists, you know, at play here, like what they're doing to keep the Americans off balance. Um, but uh, it's trying to get more to Fu Yen. Uh, Fu Yen's also fairly uh, mountainous. The interior is quite rugged. Um, so most of the population lives on the coast and along uh, the Song Ba, the river that leads to the most of the rice production, uh, the, the rice paddies themselves. Um, I think at the time, most of the population would have lived near or in Tuiwa city itself, the province capital. So most of the population is uh, centered on rice production and around that province capital. So if this is like a, 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 a it's a special province, but nothing special. It's not Saigon. It's not Way, it's not Da Nang or Cameron Bay or anything like that. Um, is it safe to say then what one of the things your project does is show us how th the big things that all Vietnam War historians talk about, whether it's search and destroy or pacification or the impact of the media or politics or the uh, decrepit nature of the South Vietnamese state, all the things that we all talk about, how those things actually function uh, in, in, a, in a local and immediate kind of way? Uh, in a way, yes. Yeah. So a big thing I argue, uh, I think I borrowed it from Greg Daddis, uh, was like you get to look at Vietnam as like a mosaic 
and that each of the provinces represent a part of that mosaic. And if we really want to understand the war, we have to understand how it transpired in each province, because I'm a big believer it went a little differently in each place. Because as much as there are similarities, there are differences. And I think we can get a much better appreciation for what the South Vietnamese went through, um, for what the, the war that, they, uh, that Arvin fought, um, even the communist perspective, if we look at each province differently. Uh, and there's some provinces that have been uh, in a way maybe even overstudied, like Phuc Toy, the Australian run province, I think has, I can't, I've lost track how many different province studies. I think every Aussie has wanted to study it and has. Um, and so I think there's a lot of problems out there that have not had that benefit of like an historian's you know, eye to go through it, figure out how the war went and what we can learn from it. And Fu Yen, uh, for me, what I, I, what I found it useful for was you could use it to see how conventional warfare and pacification went along together. That they weren't at odds, that they, that in a sense, conventional warfare was pacification. And that once conventional, once they removed conventional warfare, like from the province that you could actually see all the security issues. And that's when everything starts falling apart. Now, another thing that I think it's safe to say your your study does, although it, it does certainly have some focus on what the Americans were doing in this province, it also uh, continues the process of adding the South Vietnamese into their own story. And I was just looking around at some of the people who are uh, who, who are in the room tonight, and Jay Vyth is here, who is certainly front and center in, in doing that himself. Is, is that safe to say that that um, you're writing the South Vietnamese into the story and in what way? I tried my best to. Um, I remember during the dissertation trying to be as cautious as possible about uh, speaking on behalf of the South Vietnamese because I wasn't able to get to Vietnam to do uh, primary research and my lack of familiarity with the language. I remember talking with Heather about that. So I didn't want to like speak on behalf of them and make any errors. And so when it came time to revise for the book, uh, I was able to get a hold of some Vietnamese sources, at least gave me like a better insight into what the war was like for them. And so when possible, I tried to get a, like to add them more to the story. Uh, so there are parts where I do have conversations with like within Arvin's leadership talking about what's going on. And there are, there's a one ex very candid uh, ex uh, exchange during an Arvin meeting in Fu Yen where they're calling each other out for the problems. And I wish I could have gotten more documents like that. But at least, at least in the 1970 chapter, there's, you know, there's some really good Arvin moments there where it's South Vietnamese talking to South Vietnamese about the issues. Um, and then uh, I was able to get uh, similar like interviews um, from South Vietnamese at the time about being uh, coerced by um, the communists during, uh, was it during, during one of the infamous abduction campaigns? So I was able to add them back into the story. But I was, I was very apprehensive about trying to speak on their behalf, trying to make judgments, that sort of thing. Um, but I also, at the same time, didn't want to like go along with what the American advisors are saying that Arvin couldn't fight or blaming uh, the Saigon government for all the missteps. Uh, when possible, I try to like remind readers that a lot of the issues here were like were American caught like you were caused by the Americans. Um, and there was a great example of that that I found uh, for the book. Um, and I'll be my uh, SMH paper is actually going to hammer that home. Is that uh, in 1970 there's like this abduction crisis, and it's uh, when the PLAF uh, come uh, 
basically kind of rears its head again in Fuyan and starts abducting people for re-education. They tell them, hey, the Americans are going to leave. Uh, we're going to get ready to, you know, start running the show again. And none, the South Vietnamese stopped reporting abduction numbers. It causes a whole lot of embarrassment. And everyone's trying to figure out what to do. And Arvin says, well, let's do what the Americans trained us to do. We'll launch a massive conventional operation. We'll sweep these mountains. We'll, we'll look great. And then all the American advisors complain. They lambast them. They're like, what are you doing? We don't launch massive operations like this anymore. And they're like, you trained us to do this. And they're like, no, no, no. We do small like LARP stuff now. We don't do any of this. And they're like, you literally trained us to execute operations like this. They're like, well, we don't do that anymore. And it's like, and then I'm like, see, but the Americans set them up for this. And so you can't blame Arvin for being taught to do something. So it seems another uh, uh, that one of the uh, things we'll certainly see when this book comes out and our, all our copies come in is that there, it, there is this disconnect between the war that we're fighting and the war they're fighting that was perhaps fatal to the war itself. But maybe I should have asked this question first, but again, the, the, the conversation is a bit organic and I have the benefit of, uh, of having read this and uh, lived it along with you to a certain degree. But perhaps we ought to uh, define another pretty big term that you've used, uh, just the term pacification in general. Oh. Um, okay. what, is, what is that and how does it fit into the Vietnam War? And it's kind of a two-part question. Do we look at it one way and do the South Vietnamese perhaps look at it in a different way? So pacification is a really tricky term. And that's one I got caught up a lot on uh, for the dissertation because it's a word that no one really agreed on during the war. And if you read the Pentagon Papers, it makes it real. It makes it abundantly clear uh, there was anything that lasted uh, throughout the war. It was a lack of a definition for that word. Um, and so I, I had a chapter in the dissertation, and I have a chapter in the book that's just about trying to explain the varying definitions of it uh, and trying to get us people to understanding that at the very least, it actually encompassed the entire war effort. And so the, the easiest way to break it down is that you either thought pacification meant winning the hearts and minds, that you wanted to go out uh, and get the South Vietnamese to support the Saigon government. And maybe you would do that through building. Maybe you build schools, you build bridges, you build new homes. You say, hey, look, this is the fruits of the Saigon government. You can get more of this stuff. You just have to support Saigon. The other way was just forcing the people to do what you wanted. You, you, basically, you go out, you do just sheer control, maybe through fear, what have you. you say, hey, look, we're the people who run this show. You're going to support us, or you know, you don't want to see what happens if you don't. And then you could complicate all this further, um, because well, if you go and you just build stuff, the enemy also has a say. And that's where Pavin, Plath can come in. They could destroy everything, and then you have to rebuild it. And if you're constantly rebuilding, you're showing the people you're weak. And well, if you're weak, then the communists can take over. And so well, you, then you also have to beat the communists. And so the people are caught between this constant cycle of be, you know, clearing out the enemy, rebuilding. And so I had some like, I have some great quotes, you know, from people saying, well, you have to clear, then build, build and clear. And so pacification ultimately for me meant coming in, clearing everything out and then building. But yet it was a constant cycle, a constant cycle. And that's kind of where like destroy comes in because no matter how far along they got in this process, stuff always got destroyed. I think it's pretty meaningful about the um, nature of the confused nature and the changing nature of the Vietnam War that one of our biggest issues in coming up with your dissertation and obviously something you're still wrestling with is just the nature of that term that 
to today, people can't agree on what they thought it meant back then, uh, which again, says an awful lot about the uh, confused nature of that war. And of course, one of the basic kind of truisms of the war is that Westmoreland, our first commander over there was relatively uninterested, if not total crap at pacification. And then Abrams came along and was reasonably good at it. And ooh, if he'd have been uh, first, then maybe the whole pacification war would have been different. Uh, does your study justify any of that kind of dichotomy of war, Westmoreland bad, Abrams good? Was, there a, was, was it that simple or was there a, something a much deeper going on here? Um, I push back against, Abr uh, against Westmoreland not knowing what he was doing. Um, I don't get into it like Greg Daddis does in his book that, you know, Westmoreland had a background in counterinsurgency. Uh, I come at it from the nature of the operations that McVie launched under his uh, uh, tenure. Uh, I show that uh, Mac uh, McVie's operations or more specifically uh, first field force um, launched operations that were directly aimed at supporting pacification in Fuyen. Um, and so my whole point is to show that even early on, everything was aimed at spreading and supporting pacification. That pacification was always front and center to the point where search and destroy was pacification. And that probably will irk a bunch of Foreign Service officers and Abrams fans and what have you, but that's the conclusion I came to. It, it, to me, it made it, it. It was just clear as day that search and destroy from 1966 to 1968 was pacification. I mean, that is certainly going to rattle some uh, Vietnam War cages, as 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 you're aware, because that's certainly not the. Uh the standard way to define things, the standard way to define things is that the South Vietnamese were caring about this and we were caring about it along with them until we threw American troops in and then we just totally sidelined pacification, sidelined the South Vietnamese. And again, your research, and to me, this is indicative of the deep value of province studies. Your, your research runs counter to that meta narrative, it sounds like. Yeah, and to get to uh, I mean, I'm skipped over your question. The South Vietnamese define stuff differently. I think they were caught up in the same issue of disagreeing. Um, I, uh, when I looked at Ed Lansdale's papers at Stanford, uh, the Ministry of Rural Development and their uh, president's office, they had disagreements over stuff. They'd be giving, one day giving speeches about, this is what we're gonna do for pacification. And then the president's office being like, that's not how we define it. Like they need to get on board. No, you need, it's just like, they're like, that's not hearts of mind. We're not doing hearts of minds. And so they're caught up in the same thing. Like, well, what are the Americans telling you? And they're like, and then people are telling Lansdale, hey, get your guys on the same page. And it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And so I think it's like all these conversations in Saigon are really just about trying to get everyone on the same page, but I think often they're in different books. And that's pretty much the war as it to the end. I mean, you, uh, you kind of preempted one of my questions there, uh, and I'll kind of just state it here because I think it's worth, you know, uh, reiterating how you're gonna, uh, how your book's gonna change some of the uh, conceptions of the war. Um, the periodization of the war that <clears throat> leads from the South Vietnamese almost alone and then the American dominated uh, phase that runs 65 through 67 again the uh, maybe up to Tet 68 th that those are seen as un uniquely different phases and you're not seeing that uh, uh, I, I think that's a important again showing the depth and the uh, important uh, uh, things that province studies have to say about uh, meta narratives. Now, of course, the next big step in any Vietnam war, war meta narrative is gonna be the Tet Offensive, the, the, the thing that changes everything. How did the Tet Offensive impact what you were looking at I I in your province? Did it uh, derail pacification? Did the, the giant tactical victory that was won by uh, Western backed forces 
push pacification forward? Was this a good or bad thing in Fuya? So Tet was always one of the things that really interested me about Vietnam. Um, so it was really, I was really eager to get to that part of Phu Yen, especially because uh, a lot of the early sources I got were like, oh, it was nothing. You know, the, the Americans and South Vietnamese and the, the rocks kicked the communist forces out of whatever they took over in Phu Yen really quick. It was, it was nothing. It was pretty relatively quiet in Phu Yen. And I was like, oh. Well, great. So I'm going to get to 1968 and have really nothing to talk about. Well, uh, when I did more digging and I got more like the district level files, did more digging at CMH, got more and more like basically as the more files I accumulated, the more I realized there was a whole lot going on in 1968. So much so that I realized one, they knew the offensive was coming in Fu Yen. They didn't know when, but the communists weren't quiet. Um, they had seen basically rehearsals in late 1967. Uh, they saw the, uh, one of the Pavan main force units uh, had taken over a hamlet and like twice and refused to leave it. And basically the rocks in South uh, Vietnamese ended up having to destroy the hamlet to get rid of the main force, or uh, the, uh, sorry, the Pavan conventional force I'm mixing stuff up. But anyway, they're like, that, 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 that was a different, that was a change in tactic. They hadn't really seen that that often. Um, and so by the time we get closer to the Tet Offensive, the Americans are out uh, on an operation bowling, trying to find these larger units. And the uh, Pavin with uh, place support hit, hit the province capital hard. Uh, they don't take it the first time. The second time they're actually able to occupy, uh, the second time it's only, uh, Plaith, uh, so these are like the paramilitary, what we call the Viet Cong, uh, are able to occupy parts of it for a little while. The third attack, the third uh, attempt, like a, like a month later, uh, they're able to they go around the coastline, uh, down the beaches, and the sun gets paving again. Um, and they ac accidentally run right into the Arvin HQ. Um, and they fight Arvin in a, like a head-on battle throughout the night. Uh, American reinforcements show up the next morning. And so this would all kind of fit into the narrative that it's a huge defeat for the communists, like in terms of manpower and whatnot. Um, but what I found afterwards mattered a whole lot more. Uh, uh, American advisors noted that the population didn't come out and celebrate anything. Um, they noted that a lot of the damage had set pacification goals back by months. They noted that um, communist activity did wane, but yet there was still, you know, activity to be wary of. And then in 1969, uh, PLAF is still mounting like guerrilla activity. They're not really that quiet. They're still conducting terrorist activity. Uh, they start abducting civilians. Uh, they, they do uh, mortar attacks. So they're still there. They're, uh, so much so that, you know, they remind the civilian population that the war is not over. There's still a force to be reckoned with. And so, so in, a, in a province where nothing happened in Tet, turns out a lot happened. And oh, in, yeah. in something that was a military victory where supposedly the, uh, the bad guys were ejected from much of the countryside, I mean, you're not finding that. So again, what you've shown, I think, is the um, value of a province level study, because to most people, the Tet Offensive is Saigon and Way, and we really don't understand what else is going on in the rest of the country. So you're, you're showing that there. Uh, we, we have a bunch of questions, as it turns out. So I'm going to try to ask my last two questions and get through with those in about five minutes here. So okay. we can let the, uh, the, the uh, participants in, in the Zoom come in. 
And my next question is going to be, how did Vietnamization change all this? Can Americans, after the, in the wake of the Tet Evans, we're going to decide to go home and hand this uh, pacification war especially over to the South Vietnamese? Did that meaningfully alter things? And if so, how? So Vietnamization is really important. Uh, so Phu Yen becomes a victim of Vietnamization in that once uh, American forces start leaving Phu Yen, there's no going back. Uh, they start withdrawing them in 1969. Uh, a lot of them go to Binh Dinh where things are worse. So if Phu Yen is bad, Binh Dinh is exponentially worse. And so in conversations with Kevin Boylan um, and others, uh, we couldn't find like proof of it, but we surmise that the communists were purposely staying a little quieter in Fu Yen and a little louder in Binh Din to make gains in Fu Yen. That's what we that's what we kind of guessed, um, just to play it. Uh, um, but anyway, so American forces are never really, uh, main force units are not going to return to Fuyan no matter what. Uh, things go really bad in Fuyan in 1970 and 1971, and they prove it. MACV says, we're not sending any troops back. We, we're not. Um, they send training forces back, um, but it's all on the few rocks that are there and Arvin. And Arvin's getting stretched thinner and thinner. Uh, 1970, they actually had, Arvin had to revise its plans just so they could send forces back to Fu Yen. They had already sent forces up further into the Central Highlands to replace withdrawing U.S. forces. And so Fu Yen's always is a, it's a victim from the get-go of Vietnamization. And so if you want to look at uh, what happens when you start losing American forces perhaps too quickly and without uh, any guarantee, like without, you know, w without repercussions or consequences, or I'm trying to think of a better way to put this, uh, knowing that you're not going to get them back no matter what, Fu Yen might be a, a good case study for that. And by the way, uh, folks, if you do have questions, please, uh, now is the time to throw them into the chat. But, you know, we're, we're now to the point in the, the story that originally brought you to the story because it's in this period of Vietnamization that Courtney Forbinius finds himself there and the usual part of the story is that after the you know debilitating defeat of the communists in the Tet Offensive that the Viet Cong are essentially destroyed and that pacification thrives as a result because the war is turned over to the North Vietnamese who are going to be invaders this time and the Viet Cong are sidelined and, pac and pacification is great. And that is, as we understood it at the beginning, kind of that's what Courtney didn't see. Could Courtney went around and looked and said, pacification totally rips in these places. It's not going well. Was this a, an American narrative that we were trying to sell ourselves so we could exit from Vietnam with grace? Did we know pacification was failing? Or was it actually doing better than Courtney was willing to admit at the time? Um, I think Courtney was spot on. And I ended up finding a lot more evidence to corroborate what Courtney was saying that led up to 1971. I found evidence uh, corroborated what he was saying in 1971 itself. Um, 1972 was pretty much just an echo of what Courtney said in 1971. Uh, uh, and so what he hit on seemed to be like the nerve, like that was like as accurate as could be. And it was interesting to see that his snapshot really fit into what was like a much larger mosaic that the problems like had been there just that 1971 was too late to fix them. That the South Vietnamese, like for better or worse, had come to terms and accepted them because they, like the Americans were not gonna come back. They were gonna have to deal with it over a longer period of time on their own terms. And for the Americans by 1970, like, it's, you know, th this problem was gonna be off their hands you know, eventually, when, when, whenever, the, you know, they were told 
they were going to be out of the country was not their problem anymore. It was going to be a South Vietnamese only issue and that they had done everything they could, supposedly. And so it was just a mess. Now, the military, uh, the, the institution for which you now uh, labor, uh, loves what they refer to as actionable intelligence. Um, we are, of course, in the conflict that we're hoping ends in September, but is actually older than most of my college students now, or many of my college students. Um, and that war, of course, has an advisory and pacification and counterinsurgent element, the same kinds of things that you're looking at. And of course, you know, one would think, given the uh, tactical situation in the world today, we might even find ourselves in other situations that are perhaps akin to what you wrote about in Fu Yen. D does Fu Yen have lessons for uh, uh, us if we get involved in similar uh, situations? And it looks like we might. I think uh, Fu Yen, it, uh, so like, um, I think, like Bernard Fall wrote that, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase it loosely that, you know, the Americans seem to be falling into the same traps the French had fallen into. And I took issue with that when I first started. And then the more I read up on the French experiences in Fu Yen, the more I was like, oh, man, he, he's right. Um, and it seems, you know, sure, the American, yeah, we are Americans, you know, 20 years in Afghanistan, a lot of blood and treasure, and it's like, you know, we're leaving like the Soviets. It's like, what I don't, I don't know what's been, I don't know if we've accomplished much of anything, because, I mean, the Taliban are still there. I mean, they, they were there from the beginning. I don't know how you get some, rid of some threat that would, that's always been there. So in Fu Yen, you're trying to get rid of a communist threat that had been there when the, 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 that preceded the French in a way. And it's, how do you get rid of a, pe how do you get rid of a people that, that's call, always called it home? Maybe the ideologies change or shifted over time, but the people have always been there. So that's, I, I mean, you could try to stay as long as you want, but I don't eat and we made uh, just ideologies, but there's, uh, uh, there's something to be said about staying power, I guess. And yeah, these wars are certainly not easy. They're tough. They're, 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 they're long. Uh, they require as much cultural sensitivity as they require military prowess. I mean, it, it's such a, it's such a complicated thing. And then again, that, that, that's the, one of the wonderful things your book does is it shows the, the depth that you're going to have to uh, uh, go to uh, across the board in a, in a, I mean, heck, if we didn't even understand what the word meant, uh, we, we were unlikely to, to be successful in prosecuting said misunderstood word. And I would, I think it's perfectly valid today to think that that word still carries uh, uh, different associations for different people, depending on what as aspect of pacification they're trying to implement. So maybe if the military's number one rule is choose and maintain a achievable aim, uh, coming to terms with what the word means, that's the centerpiece of your aim might be important. Uh, let's move over to a couple questions now as they are rolling in. The first question is from Daniel, and I'm going to massacre this last name, but Wegeland, perhaps. Uh, it says, do you see any evidence that the arguments in the headquarters over the intent philosophy of pacification had any effect in the way pacification was implemented in Fu Yen? So did these arguments that guys like Lansdale were having about what this term meant, did that actually impact what you saw on the ground? That's a good question. Um... Uh, it's hard to it's hard to say because MACV had an early definition of pacification. It spelled it out uh, quite succinctly what it entailed, but there were still people debating it. 
it was supposed to be a definition that uh, MACV, um, the State Department, so the embassy, all the basically Americans in Saigon or in Vietnam as a whole agreed on. But yet, even after it was adopted, they're all debating it. And so pro uh, probably as far as MACV went, that was what they were operating under, that definition. But as far as the debate went, it was still undecided. So from a military sense, yes, MACV is going into Fuyen with that idea of pacification in mind. Uh, later on, when we get CORES or the civilian operations and revolutionary support or develop uh, revo civil operations and revolutionary development support, which is what uh, with that military civilian hybrid um, after around 1967 or so, that really uh, gives pacification a lot more teeth. Uh, they're going to come in with a come in with a different definition. Um, one of many, anyway. Um, so that debate, even if MACB had an idea and went with it, there's still just people in Saigon are still debating it, still disagreeing. So pacification is kind of like art. You know it when you see it, right? You may not understand it, but you know it when you see it kind of thing. Um, Haley, who's actually sitting right here across the table from me, has a question or two, and I'm going to uh, uh, move to the second part of her question. Can you give us a little background on who Courtney is or was and uh, about his collection? What, what does his collection like have in it? So a little background on Courtney. Um, i trying to remember. Uh, I believe Courtney was initially um, connected to your boys at 67 book, correct? He was. Uh, uh, Courtney served in the 9th Infantry Division. And actually, as far as um, our, um, our USM program was concerned, he, he was the tour guide uh, who, who, who led us over there. But it turned out he had this whole second military career as a uh, as uh, uh, this link to pacification, which I didn't know anything about until he gave us his papers. Yeah, so his uh, second life in Vietnam uh, <clears throat> would have been a member of advisory team 28, uh, which was the advisory team under cords that was responsible for advising the South Vietnamese authorities in Phu Yen on revolutionary development, which was another term for pacification. They also called it rural development, pacification. Um, and so his job, like I mentioned earlier, was going around evaluating territorial forces. Um, I don't remember his rank at the time. I'm not sure if that matters, uh, but in the collection itself, he has like background on his uh, career in Vietnam. He has all his uh, evaluations. He has his uh, log, I believe, like so his um, summaries of what Hamlet conditions were like, his reports to his superiors. I think he has copies of some of their responses. He has some after action reports. Uh, there was a one pretty big battle in 1971 that saw some of the territorial forces he had observed uh, do really, really well against some um, uh, main force units. Uh, and then I believe he has some other materials. I don't quite remember. I was mainly just interested in his observations of Hamlet conditions. So, because that helped me understand um, security issues. So Courtney's uh, uh, materials gave you that thing that um, so many military records don't, it sounds like. Uh, real depth, uh, uh, asking questions, uh, trying to wrestle with things as opposed to just ticking boxes. We went from this grid coordinate to that grid coordinate and here's the way the day progressed that, that Courtney as a deeply yeah. intellectual person in his own right was was wrestling with some issues and that gave you some an insight you probably wouldn't have gotten any other way like he, he would tell you like oh yeah this hamlet has a really good security ranking 
Uh, but I went in there and no one lives there. Like it should not even be on our maps. It's abandoned. Or I, uh, my sources there tell me that uh, recruitment is high amongst uh, this uh, Viet Cong local force. Um, or this main force unit based out of there, or the fishermen there take rice up to Bin Din for a main force unit. None of this stuff was appearing on other like reports. So he had a, he, a lot of good information came out of his stuff. Uh, let's move on to the next question from another uh, uh, a friend of ours. This is from Martin Clemens. Um, and uh, this is a pretty detailed question. So I, I hope you get the uh, base area reference because I don't, I'm, I don't know it that well. Uh, what role did base area 236 and terrain play in the failure of pacification in Fu Yen? Uh, great to see you here, Martin. I'd actually look up on the, the book map for uh, 236. I had to make sure a couple of them. So this was the infamous hub. Um, all, all the reports uh, from start to finish called it the hub. And this was quite mountainous terrain, pretty much smack in the middle of the province. And no matter how many times uh, the allies cleared it out, it was reoccupied. And they called it the hub because it was the center of all communist activity in the province. So not only was it in the middle, but everything seemed to come out of it. The attacks against the province capital for, uh, on Tet came from there. It overlooked the rice production uh, in the Tuiwa Valley. Uh, and so, yeah, it played a key role in the failure of pacification in Fu Yen. Um, and it was only about, if I remember, maybe, don't quote me on this, but maybe 50 kilometers away from the province capital. This is all pretty close together. So yeah, um, that, I mean, the only other place that rivaled that was like another, one other base area that caused a lot of trouble, but that was further inland, but yeah. Uh, eventually they get so frustrated. I mean, they're always frustrated with this, this base area. I, it was comical just reading the reports. They're like, just send people in there just to remind the communists that we're here. Well, kudos to Martin for remembering uh, 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 what you wrote better than I did. And I, and I had to, I had to you know, correct commas and stuff on it. So uh, Martin has a great memory there. A uh, question from Robert Davis. We have two more questions to go that we can have time for. Uh, did U.S. advisors change in any appreciable ways over the time, over the time that you studied the Vietnam War? Or at least in uh, Fu Yen. Um, I found them to be maybe more cynical as their tours went on. I was always warned um, that maybe when they showed up, they would be like trying to make everything look bad and so that, you know, the, don't trust numbers because maybe they'll say, hey, everything's bad here. Now look how good I made it, that kind of stuff. But I saw more people on their tours saying like, hey, this place has gone to hell. I don't know what we're trying to do here, but obviously it's not, we're not gonna win it or at least not while I'm here, we're gonna get anywhere. And so I was, uh, pretty surprised by how candid a lot were. So I got a little quote happy, much to the press's uh, dismay that, cause there's just so many great, so many great lines from these individuals just about like, that they just, you know, like, are we gonna get help or not type stuff? Or are you gonna do anything? Or I have no like bleeping clue about what's going on in my own district. Like just honest, just brutally honest. And I found the longer their tours went on, the more honest we came, that they became. Um, especially even the, uh, the, the, the final senior province advisor, I think he was a Lieutenant Colonel, maybe a full board Colonel at the time. His final, you no, know, it was his end of tour report. He put in there, he was like, I have no idea how much of Fu Yen the South Vietnamese even control. He's like, I, he's like, I don't know what we have to show for any of that war. And it's like, I was like, whoa. 
Well, that's a uh, pretty revealing uh, uh, for a guy who presumably wants to continue his career in the military. And yeah. uh, the last question from another uh, uh, from another Dale Center alum and one of our uh, good friends. This is uh, from Tim Hemmes. He asks you what advice would you have for students thinking about working in Vietnam history or in military history? Well, let's, let's kind of put that into Vietnam War history because maybe we'll have a few uh, following in your footsteps. What advice would you have for students who kind of want to pursue the same kind of thing you pursued here? Um, I'd say if you want to do what I did and you want to do a province study, I'd, I'd pick one that hasn't been done before and maybe find one that is that, that, that fascinates you for whatever reason. Fu Yan was because, you know, Courtney's papers, like he asked a question in them, like why did it get so bad in 71? And that's what it took for me to go, I wanna know why it got so bad. Maybe you find other veterans papers or maybe you start reading about a province and there's something and maybe that the, the, uh, the, the ethnic group there or the geography or something that it gets you interested. As long as you have a hook, I say follow it. Um, there's a lot of problems that haven't been studied. So I imagine there's quite a few hooks out there. Um, and then I would say make, I'd make the most out of a lot of the digital resources out there. There I got really, really lucky. Uh, not really any lucky, but I found a lot of really good digitized sources uh, through Texas Tech. Um, I networked a lot. Um, so I was able to get a lot of stuff from other historians. They had digitized themselves. And so there's a lot of really good primary sources out there if you just look and ask nicely. And you'll be surprised about how much maybe like an obscure province like Fu Yen can actually have on it. Well, there you go. We are right up on our time uh, for this inaugural alumni chat uh, uh, sponsored by the Dale Center with our very own Dr. Rob Thompson, whose book is coming out next month. Now that you've gotten a preview of that book, I hope you uh, rock on over to amazon.com or your favorite place where you buy books and uh, check out Clear, Hold and Destroy pacification in Fu Yen and the American war in Vietnam. And now that you see what wonderful kind of stuff our graduates turn out, hey, send us some, uh, send us some more students to write more great uh, dissertations in the future. And we have one uh, more comment here uh, that you can read there, Rob, um, uh, about, ooh, that, uh, about maybe you having you come speak uh, at a New York Military Affairs Symposium. So there you go. The uh, oh, cool. The, the the networking the networking continues, uh, and that's what uh, wonderful uh, things like this allow us to do digitally is have people in who perhaps wouldn't be able to come sit in a classroom with us and hear you chat. But we do look forward to having you down here to chat. Uh, again, sometime in the near future. And thanks so much, Rob and Dr. Thompson. There you go. And <laughs> thanks to the entire audience. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you all for having me. It's been fantastic.